thank you so much for reading Bible for us. Let me add my welcome to that Toby. Uh, so my name is Lee, I'm the senior pastor of the church. Great to see you, particularly here for the baptism, uh, which will happen later. Um, at this church, we love uh, the Bible, we believe it is God's book. And I don't know if your expectation is that the God who made you is a God who communicates, but that is our expectation, that God in heaven is not silent, uh, he is the best communicator in the universe, and he longs to speak to us. So we're going to pray. I don't know what's in front of you at the moment, but if the God of the universe has something to say to us, uh, then I'd love to encourage you. Uh, grab your Bible, uh, or if you want it on your phone, uh, find something like Bible Gateway, or get an app. Uh, let's open up uh, Genesis chapter 41, and we'll pray. Uh, we'll pray a dangerous prayer. Uh, we'll pray that God will speak and we will listen and so that our lives will not be the same again. So let us pray that. Father, we thank you that you are a God who speaks. Uh, we pray that our lives will not be the same as a result of what we are about to hear. Uh, help us to raise our sights to you, the God of abundant grace and glory. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. I cannot do it. It's a phrase that doesn't sit comfortably in our 21st century world, does it? Uh, we inhabit a time uh, when the self is king or queen. Uh, we're told that we can do anything. Uh, we're told that we can be anyone we want. We can always improve ourselves, help ourselves, if only we would believe in ourselves. Um, the mantra, the message is consistent and it is compelling. You can do it. Of course you might need to focus or study or slow down or get stronger or get fitter or make yourself more beautiful or likable or funny but whatever it takes the message is the same we live in a Barbie world and if you live in a Barbie world it means you can do anything and be anyone you want well this morning I want to show us from the Bible that the complete opposite is true. Okay, look at verse 16. Uh, chapter 41, verse 16. I cannot do it. It's not quite the full sentence. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Now, if you were visiting us, we're in the middle of the adventures of a man called Joseph. Uh, the story so far uh, in this book is a bit like a supercharged episode of your favourite drama series. Uh, it might be EastEnders, it might be The Crown, whatever it is for you, supercharge it by a million and you're in the story of Joseph. It's been the story of family jealousy, hatred and lies. Uh, we've seen Joseph thrown into a deep pit by his brothers with the intention of starving him to death. Happy family. And then we watch them dramatically change their minds and instead of watching him starve to death, they get him out of the pit and they sell him to slave traders who take him to Egypt. And when he gets there, he finds himself on the receiving end of the advances of the boss's wife. Uh, he rejects her advances and that leaves him locked up in a prison. Now last week, it looked as if the tables might be turning for this young man. He is 28 years old, and last week we thought it was going to change. He helps out the chief cupbearer to the king of Egypt, who happens to be in the prison with him, and he says, when you get out, which he's about to get out, remember me, do me a favour, put a good word with the pharaoh, and we think everything's going to change. Everything is lined up, so it seems, for Joseph's imminent release. But the chapter ends with a devastating sentence that blows Joseph's hopes out of the water. If you've got your Bibles open, just look at the very last verse of chapter 40. The chief cupbearer, however, did not 
Remember Joseph. He forgot. Oh, well, now, now we're in the realms of dashed expectations. Joseph thought this was the moment of release. This was the time of transformation, when he would never hear the clink of the keys on the prison door. But no, the clock keeps ticking. And the monotony, the daily monotony of Joseph's life continues without change. Ever had a period of life out in your life? The monotony just keeps on going. You escape into Netflix, but then you look at your life, and day after day, it's the same. The same breakfast, the same walk, the same journey, the same thing you type into your computer at work, the same arguments with the family, and then it's bedtime again and you hit the alarm and you think, another day. The monotony continues for Joseph. And this will last for another two years. And then things begin to change. Look at the first verse of chapter 41. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile, when out of the river there came seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the I think they were allowed to call cows ugly, aren't you? They're not allowed to call babies ugly, but you can call the cows ugly. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek fat cows, and then Pharaoh woke up. Okay, so he has a dream. He has one of those dreams that leaves you sweating on the sheets. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare of ugly, malnourished cannibal cows <laughs> eating other cows that are healthy and strong. Oh, no wonder he went, what? Well, maybe it was just a cheese he ate before going to sleep. So he closes his eyes and he continues to sleep. But then there is another horrifying picture being displayed before uh, and inside his head. This time he sees seven heads of healthy grain. Well, so far so good, maybe it's going to be all right. But then it all turns dark. Seven more thin heads of ugly grain, whatever they are, grain appear. And then it all turns really bad because then that healthy grain they start, or the, the, the unhealthy ones start eating up. The healthy ones. Ah! He's awake again. Yeah. It's another scale. Well, in verse uh, 18, uh, we thought what he does in the morning. In the morning, his mind was troubled. So he sent for all the magicians and all the wise men of Egypt. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. It's like a scene from Harry Potter, isn't it? All the best magicians from Hogwarts arrive, and they are told to disturb nightmares from one of the most powerful men alive, and they are as useful as a chocolate teapot. They are completely useless. They can say nothing. They have no understanding. And it's at this point, at this point, the chief cupbearer has a profound moment of recollection. <coughs> Verse 9. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. You bet you. Remember? Two years before? Remember me? Yeah, yeah, all right, Joseph. At this moment, I remember my sins. Pharaoh was once angry with the servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now, there was a young Hebrew there with us, a servant of the captain of the guards. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving us uh, the interpretation of, of the dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. He does leave out a bit, doesn't he, when he says, he did say to me, remember me, and I forgot it. Well, so Joseph, Pharaoh was sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought up from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, of course, he was in a prison, so he would have been disgusting. So he has to be cleaned up and made ready for the king of Egypt. So he gets shaved, changes his clothes, and he came before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, no one can interpret it for me, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Are you there now? Here he is, out of the prison, this is his moment, he's standing before Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, I've heard that you, you can 
can interpret the dreams. Well, imagine you were Joseph. How are you going to respond in this scenario? Surely, well, this is it, isn't it? This is the most important moment that will determine your earthly future. Are you going to go back to prison or work? Or is it the moment that you've been longing for when you can live in the freedom of the palace? How do you respond to Pharaoh's statement that he, he is her, that you, of all people, you can interpret the dreams? Now, would you be brave enough to say the words in verse 16? I cannot do it. And if you were brave enough to say the beginning of that sentence, how much of a pause would you leave before you said the rest? <laughs> I cannot do it. No, I'm, I'm not finished. I'm not finished. But, God. God can give you the answer, Pharaoh. Now here's a sentence that I I'm pray, and will continue to pray, that God will soldier onto, soldier onto your brain and hardwire onto your very core. You ready? This is it. I cannot do it, but God. All right, that's it. We're going we're gonna to go deeper into this now. I cannot do it, but God. Now, at first sight, I know that might seem like a defeatist way to live. A sure way to crush your adventure, kill your enthusiasm, keep you all miserable all your days. However, let me say to you, the opposite is actually true. Having such a God-centered view of the universe is exactly what we all need. It liberates us from that overwhelming pressure that it's all about me and what I can do. It keeps us from foolish pride and enables us to live out God's passions, the passion that really matters. I cannot do it, but God. And there are many different areas of life where that truth needs to be worked out, but today I want to highlight the three areas that we are shown in Genesis chapter 41. Here they are. I, they're on your outline if you've got one of them. I cannot know everything, but God can show me. I cannot control the future, but God can. And I cannot save myself, but God can help me. All right, let's work it out. It's glorious truth. First, I cannot know everything, but God can show me. Now, for Pharaoh, the focus is on the meaning of his nightmares. He's no idea what they mean, and neither do his advisors. They are useless. But look at what God reveals in verse 25. Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. The seven good ears are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean ugly cows that come up afterwards are seven years, and so are the seven worthless ears of corn, scorched by the east wind. And there are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows will be so severe. Now, of course, there's, there's lots of information that we can discover uh, without an active belief in God. <coughs> we know that, don't we? And Christians don't automatically make the best plumbers. And they don't automatically make the best doctors or the best pilots. Okay, I just encourage you, if you want to get a good plumber, a good doctor, a good pilot, don't just ask if they're a Christian. Ask if they're qualified. As much we can discover about the world through our intellectual inquiry, through our ongoing experience, but, but there are countless questions that we are clueless to answer without God's revelation. We just can't do it. Who is God? Unless God tells us, we have no idea. We can guess. We can make it up, we can speculate, but we've got no idea. What is God like? What does God think of us? Not what would I like him to think of me, but what does he actually think of me? What's the point of my life? Is there a future beyond the grave? Is there a heaven and a hell? How do I get to heaven if there is one? Oh, we love to speculate, we love to imagine, we love to share our opinions about what we would like it to be, but without God's revelation, it is all make-believe. 
it is over everything. But the great news of the Bible is that the God who made us is an active communicator. The God of the Bible is not playing a deadly game of hide and seek. He wants to be known. He is active in communication. And all throughout the Bible, he is speaking to his people. He is communicating his will and his wishes to his people. He lets them know the answers to the biggest questions of our existence. And all that culminates in the sending of the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ, into the world 2,000 years ago. We need to know that the birth of Jesus is the ultimate sign that God wants to be So for the big questions of life, let's be honest about our ignorance. Let's say it out loud. I cannot do it. But then let's finish the sentence. I cannot do it. Fuck God. Fuck God. I cannot know everything, but God can show me. Indeed, God has shown me. And the answers are in this book, the Bible, which of course means we need to open its pages, discover the point and purpose of our life here on earth, but it can be done if you look in the right place. So second, I cannot control the future, but God does. Uh, look at verse uh, 32, why the, uh, the repetition of the dreams, the reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it's soon. To the implication of that verse is unmistakable. The matter has been firmly decided by God. God will do it soon. That is, the picture you have here, the truth revealed by God, is that the God of the universe is completely sovereign over the affairs of human beings. We are not masters of our own faith. We are not the captains of our souls. No, the God in heaven determines what happens here on earth. Now that doesn't make us puppets uh, without responsibility. We're not robots uh, without any passions or responsibilities. No, we are apex creatures made in the image of God. And yet our days are numbered and our days are directed by the sovereign hand of God. We do not know what will happen tomorrow. But God does. We have no idea what will happen. I was at a music concert last night. The music was incredible. And the man two seats away from me almost died. And if he hadn't been treated by a doctor, he may well have not made it to the end of that concert. He went home in an ambulance to the hospital. Nobody thought that would happen when he went out. We don't know, do we? But God knows the future. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm going to say, let's not fool ourselves, because that will scare you to think that I am the master of my faith. I, little me, little you, is the captain of your soul. How ridiculous, how anxiety-ridden is that? I cannot do it. But God. I cannot control my future, but God loves me. I don't know, do you sleep well at night? The sovereign hand of God is the liberating truth that we need to hear. I sleep well at night until my children come through and say, I've had a nightmare! All right, rouse the compassion. <laughs> but without that, I sleep well at night. I don't sleep well at night because I've got no worries or concerns. If you're, if you're running out of worries and concerns, chat to me later, I'll give you those. <laughs> it's not because I don't care about people, but it's because I believe in a God who never sleeps. And because God is in charge of the universe, it means I can sleep at night. I cannot do it. But God. Last. I cannot save myself, but God can help me. Uh, Pharaoh, as you can see, is, is way over his head, isn't he? The situation is so serious. He cannot solve it by himself. He needs the help of God. And God provides the rescue that Pharaoh needs in a very particular way. Uh, look at verse 33. Uh, and now, let Pharaoh look for a discernment. 
learned and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Now, what do you think Joseph was thinking as he says that? I suspect he knows he's about to pitch for the role. Okay? Yeah, what, you, what you really need is to find a really wise person who will be able to help you. I think he, he's got a pitch for the role. You're about to hear what he says, this wonderful plan for how to do it. But of course, Joseph knows that he is God's man in God's place for God's time. God has been working this out all the way through. And now is the moment and Joseph says, okay, here we go. And here is the plan of action. He spells it out, verses 34 to 36. If you follow this, this is how it's going to work. He sets out the detailed plan for how the forthcoming famine will be managed. And what is Pharaoh's response, verse 37? Well, the plan seemed good to Pharaoh, to all the officials. So Pharaoh asked him, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? So Pharaoh says to Joseph, since God has made it all known to you, there is no one so discerning as wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders, only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Well, what a transformation that is. I cannot do it. Uh, what's the point? Pharaoh, Pharaoh cannot save himself, Pharaoh cannot save his nation, but God can do it. God can help. In fact, God has arranged for his servant to be in the right place, fully equipped, uh, to be the saviour that people need. And of course, this is even more true of us. Even more true of us. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot get to heaven by our own efforts. We can't. If there's one thing you please hear me say today is this. Getting to heaven is not by being a good person. We are sinners who deserve the wrath of God, who deserve to be punished. But Jesus Christ has died on the cross, raised from the dead, and offers salvation as a free, generous gift. We cannot save ourselves, but God can do it. We cannot fix our broken lives. You cannot fix the broken family that you are part of. We cannot do it by ourselves. So stop putting that responsibility on your shoulders. I can't be liberated. Say it out. I cannot do it, but God. Jesus Christ is Joseph multiplied by a billion. Jesus is God's servant in the right place at the right time who will be in that place to bring the salvation we need. He can get us to paradise and he can help navigate through our broken days. So as we finish, maybe there are some of us today and we've just got to abandon the mantra that doesn't work. It doesn't work and it only makes us feel like a failure. You're not Barbie, you're not Ken, you're you, because God is God. And when you abandon the mantra that doesn't work and makes you feel like a failure, the alternative is to embrace the God who can be for us and with us all our days. I cannot do it. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you that you you tell us the truth. You show us Jesus. And we pray that we would believe that he is enough for us. We pray, Lord, that we live our days liberated and from the pressure to achieve everything with him. Help us to look to Jesus, our King and Saviour, knowing His unconditional love and His generous grace. And we pray that we joy as we respond to Jesus. For the glory of His name. Amen. Amen.